Section 27 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Impossible Enchantment by the Count de Caylus. Translated by James Planchet. Part 1. Once upon a time there was a king who was very much beloved by his subjects, and who was equally fond of them. This monarch had a great repugnance to marriage, and what was still more astonishing, love had never made the slightest impression on his heart. His subjects, however, pressed so strongly upon him the necessity of providing for the succession to the throne, that the good king finally consented to their request but as no woman he had as yet seen had awakened in him the faintest inclination to marry her, he resolved to seek in foreign lands that which his own had failed to present him with, and despite the severe and satirical remarks of all his countrywomen, both handsome and ugly, he set out on his travels, after having duly provided for the maintenance of order and tranquillity in his dominions. He would take no one with him but a single equerry, a very sensible man, but not particularly brilliant. Such companions are not always the worst upon a journey. The king roamed in vain through several kingdoms, using all his best endeavours to fall in love, but his time not being come, he retraced his road to his own dominions, after two years' absence and fatigue, in the same state of indifference as he left them. It happened, however, that in transversing a forest, he heard a most fearful squalling of cats, the worthy equerry did not know what to think of such a commencement of an adventure. All the stories of sorcerers that he had ever seen came into his head. As to the king, he was unmoved by it. Courage and curiosity combined to induce him to wait and see what would follow this strange and disagreeable interruption. The noise coming nearer and nearer, they at length saw a hundred Spanish cats rush by them through the forest. You might have covered them all with a cloak, so well did they run together and so perfectly were they on the scent. They were closely followed by two of the largest monkeys that ever were seen. They were dressed in amaranth-coloured coats. Their boots were the prettiest and best made in the world. They were mounted on two superb English bulldogs, and rode at full speed, blowing little toy trumpets. The king, surprised at such a sight, gazed at them with great attention. When a score of tiny dwarfs appeared, some mounted on lynxes and leading relays of them, others on foot, with cats in couples. They were dressed in amaranth, like the huntsman, which colour seemed to be the livery of the equipage. A moment afterwards he perceived a young female, as remarkable for her beauty as for the proud air with which she rode a large tiger, whose paces were admirable. She passed the king full gallop, without stopping or even saluting him. But though she hardly looked at him, he was enchanted with her, and his heart was gone like a flash of lightning. All in agitation, he perceived a dwarf who had lagged behind the rest of the company. He addressed him with all that eagerness which the curiosity of love to obtain some information respecting the object of its admiration would naturally occasion. The dwarf informed him that the lady he had just seen was a princess Mudin, daughter of King Prudent, in whose dominions they were at that moment. He told him also that the princess was exceedingly fond of the chase, and that the pack he had seen pass was what she hunted rabbits with. The king asked nothing further, except the nearest road to the court of King Prudent. The dwarf pointed it out to him, and spurred on his lynx to rejoin the hunt, and the king, with the impatience of a newborn passion, gave the spurs to his horse, and in less than two hours found himself in the capital of King Prudent's dominions. He was presented to the king and queen, who received him with open arms, the more graciously on learning his name and that of his empire. The beautiful Mutine returned from the chase shortly after this presentation. Hearing that the princess had killed two rabbits, he ventured to compliment her on so fine a day's sport, but the princess made no reply. He was rather surprised at her silence, but he was still more so when he observed that during supper she was equally taciturn. He noticed only that there were moments when she appeared about to say something, but that either King Prudent or the Queen, who never drank at the same time, immediately commenced speaking. The silence, however, did not prevent the increase of his passion for Mutine. 
the king retired to the handsome apartment which had been assigned to him and his worthy equerry did not appear overjoyed when he found his royal master so deeply in love he did not even conceal from him that he was sorry for it and why are you sorry inquired the king the princess is so beautiful surely she is all i could desire she is beautiful i admit replied the equerry but to be happy something is required besides beauty pardon me sire but there is something harsh in the expression of her features it is pride said the king and very becoming in so beautiful a woman pride or ill-nature whichever you please but the taste she exhibits in her amusements and her choice of so many mischievous animals are to my mind convincing proofs of a cruel disposition moreover the care that is taken to prevent her speaking is to me a very suspicious circumstance the king her father is not called prudent for nothing i don't fancy even her own name of mutine it appears to me only a softening down or a diminutive of the appellation which would truly be applied to her from the impression she has made on me for you know better than i do that it is too common a practice to gloss over the faults of persons of her rank the observations of the worthy equerry were sensible enough but as objections only increase love in the hearts of all men and particularly in those of kings who dislike being contradicted this monarch the very next morning demanded the hand of the princess in marriage as the previous indifference of the king had become notorious the triumph of the charms of mutine was complete her hand was accorded to him but on two conditions the first that the marriage should take place the very next morning the second that he should not speak to the princess until she was his wife on this occasion the pretext for her silence was a solemn vow she had taken in consequence of the first thing that came into their heads and the enamoured king only saw in this circumstance the proof of a truly religious feeling those great precautions formed a new theme for the arguments of the equerry but they made no more impression than the former did the king after listening to them closed the conversation by saying it has cost me a great deal of trouble to fall in love i have done so at last what the deuce wouldst thou have i mean to remain in love the rest of that day and all the following was passed in dancing and feasting the princess was present and took her part in all the entertainments without uttering a single word and the first he heard her pronounce was the fatal yes which bound her to him for life as soon as she was married she threw off all restraint and the first day did not pass without her having very liberally distributed a volley of abuse and a host of impertinences amongst her maids of honour in short the mildest expressions she made use of in return for the most particular services were characterised by rudeness and ill-temper even the king her husband was not exempted from this sort of language but as he was very much in love and moreover a good-natured man he bore it all patiently a few days after their marriage the newly wedded pair took the road to their own kingdom and mutine's departure was not regretted by any one in her father's the cordial reception king prudent had always given to foreigners had no other motive than the hope of such a love as his daughter's charms had succeeded in inspiring a passion which was too strong to pause for a better acquaintance with her mind and character the worthy equerry had had too much reason for his remonstrances and the king perceived it too late all the time the new queen was on the road she filled the hearts of her attendants with grief anger and despair but once arrived in her kingdom her ill-temper and ill-nature were redoubled by the time she had been a month on her throne her reputation was perfect she was acknowledged unanimously as the worst queen in the world one day that she was taking an airing on horseback in a wood near the palace she perceived an old woman walking in the high road she was very simply dressed this good woman having made her the best curtsy she could continued her route but the queen who was only waiting for an occasion to give vent to her ill-humour bade one of her pages run after the old woman and bring her back as soon as she was in her presence she said thou art very impertinent to make me no lower a curtsy dost thou not know i am the queen i am more than half inclined to order my people to give thee a hundred lashes with their stirrup leathers madam said the old woman i never knew exactly what difference there was in curtsies it is clear i had no intention of being disrespectful how exclaimed the queen does she dare to answer me tie her instantly to the tail of my horse 
I will take her with speed to the best dancing master in the city, and he shall teach her how to make me a curtsy. The old woman begged for mercy whilst they tied her, but in vain. She even boasted of the protection of the fairies. The queen heeded the warning as little as the prayer. I care for them as little as I do for thee, she exclaimed, and wert thou even thyself a fairy, I would serve thee the same way. The old woman suffered herself patiently to be fastened to the tail of the horse. But the instant the queen would have given him the spur, he became motionless. In vain she endeavoured to stick the rowels into his side. He had become a horse of bronze. The cords which fastened the old woman changed at the same moment to garlands of flowers, and the old woman herself suddenly appeared eight feet high. Then fixing on Mutine her fiery and disdainful eyes, she said to her, Wicked woman, unworthy of the royal title thou bearest, I desired to judge myself if thou didst deserve the bad character they give thee in the world. I am satisfied thou dost, and thou shalt soon see whether the fairies are as little to be feared as thou fanciest. So saying, the fairy Paceable, for it was she herself, whistled through her fingers, and a chariot was seen advancing, drawn by six of the most beautiful ostriches in the world and in this chariot they recognised the fairy grave, looking more grave even than her name. She was at that time the elder of the fairies, and presided in all cases affecting the fairy community. Her escort was composed of a dozen other fairies, mounted on crop-tailed dragons. Notwithstanding her astonishment at the appearance of the fairies, Queen Mutine retained the proud and malevolent expression which was so natural to her. When this brilliant company had descended and dismounted, the fairy Paceable related her adventure to them. The fairy Grave, who was very severe in the execution of her office, approved of Paceable's conduct, and then gave it as her opinion that the queen should be transformed into the same metal as her horse. But the fairy Paceable objected to this, and with unequalled generosity, exerted herself to moderate all the rigorous measures that were suggested for the punishment of the queen. At length, thanks to the kind fairy, she was condemned only to be her slave until she was confined, for I had forgotten to tell you that she was expecting to become a mother. This sentence, which was pronounced in full court, decreed that, on her recovery, the queen should be permitted to return to her husband, and that the infant she had given birth to should remain the slave of the fairy in her place. They were polite enough to announce to the king the sentence that had been passed on his wife. He was compelled to give his assent to it. What could the worthy prince have done, supposing he had objected? After this act of justice, the fairies returned each one to her own affairs. Paceable waited an instant the arrival of her equipage, which she had sent for. It was a little car made of various coloured bugles, drawn by six hinds, white as snow, with caparisons of green satin embroidered with gold. One touch of her wand changed the queen's dress into the habit of a slave. In this attire she was made to mount an obstinate mule, and to follow at a hard trot the car of the fairy. After an hour's jolting, the queen arrived at Paceable's mansion. As you may easily believe, she was in great affliction, but her pride prevented her from shedding a single tear. The fairy sent her to work in the kitchen, after giving her the name Furieuse that of Mutine being too gentle for the wickedness she was inclined to. Furious, said the fairy Paceable, I have saved your life, and perhaps conscience may hereafter reproach me for it. I will not give you any heavy work to do, out of compassion for the unborn infant, who you are aware is to become my slave. I will therefore remove you from the kitchen, and set you only the task of sweeping my apartment, and combing my little dog, Christine. Furios knew there was no opposition to be made to these commands. She took, therefore, the sensible course of doing exactly as she was bid, as long as she was able. After some time she gave birth to a princess, as lovely as day, and when her health was re-established, the fairy lectured her severely, respecting her past life, extracted from her a promise to behave better in future, and sent her back to the king her husband. One may imagine from the kindness shown by the fairy Paceable to so wicked a woman what affectionate care she would take of the young princess who was left in her hands. She soon perfectly doted on her, 
and determined to have her endowed by two fairies besides herself. She was a long time deciding on the two godmothers she should select, for she feared that the resentment they all felt against the mother might be extended to the child. At length she thought that the fairies Divertisante and Evely were amongst the best-natured of them, and invited them accordingly. They arrived in a berline made of Italian flowers, drawn by six grey ponies with beautiful flame-coloured manes. Evely's robe was composed of parrot's feathers, and her hair was dressed en chien fou. Footnote. Literally, mad dog fashion, one of the many extravagant whims of the day. End footnote. The fairy divertisante had a robe of chameleon skin, which made her appear alternately in every imaginable colour. Paceable gave them both a capital reception, and to ensure their good offices, I have been confidently informed that during the excellent supper they sat down to, she managed to make them just merry enough with wine. Having taken this wise precaution, she had the lovely infant brought to them. It was in a cradle of rock crystal, and swathed in clothes of scarlet, embroidered with gold. But its beauty was a hundred times more brilliant than its apparel. The young princess smiled at the fairies, and made little attempts to kiss them, which so pleased them that they determined to place her, as far as it laid in their power, beyond the reach of the anger of their elders. They began by giving her the name of Galantine. The fairy Paceable then said to them, You know that the punishments we fairies usually inflict consist in changing beauty to ugliness, intellect to imbecility, and in many cases resorting to transformation. Now, as it is impossible for us to endow her with more than one gift each, my advice is that one of you should bestow upon her beauty, the other intelligence, and that I, for my part, should render it impossible for any one to change her form. This advice was adopted and followed upon the spot. As soon as Galantine was endowed, the two fairies took their leave, and Paceable gave all her attention to the education of the little princess. Never was such attention so well rewarded, for at four years of age her grace and beauty had already begun to make a noise in the world. In fact, they made too much noise, for the circumstance of the case having been reported to the Council of Fairies, Paceable one morning saw the fairy grave enter the courtyard of the palace, mounted on a lion. She wore a long robe, very full, and consequently very much plaited, of sky-blue colour, and on her head a square cap of gold brocade. Paceable recognised her with as much anxiety as vexation, for her dress and the animal she rode proved that she came to promulgate some decree, but when she perceived that she was followed by the fairy Revus, mounted on a unicorn, and dressed in black morocco, faced with changeable taffeta, and wearing also a square cap, she no longer doubted that this visit had some very serious object. In short, Fairy Grave, opening the business, said to her, I am much surprised at the conduct you have pursued towards Mutine. It is in the name of the whole body of fairies, whom she has insulted, that I come to reprimand you. You are at liberty to forgive her offences to yourself, but you had no right to pardon her for those which she had committed against the entire community. Nevertheless, you treated her with mildness and kindness during the time she resided with you. I therefore come to do strict justice and punish an innocent child for the acts of a guilty mother. You have endowed her with beauty and intelligence, and you have also raised an obstacle against her transformation. But though I cannot deprive her of the gifts you have bestowed upon her, I know how to prevent her deriving any advantage from them as long as she lives. She shall never be able to get out of an enchanted prison which I am about to build for her, until she shall find herself in the arms of a lover who is beloved by her. It is my business to take care that such an event shall never occur. The enchantment consisted of a tower of great height and size, built of shells of all colours, in the middle of the sea. On the lowest floor there was a great bathroom, into which the water could be admitted at pleasure. The bath was surrounded by steps and slabs, on which you could walk with dry feet. The first floor was devoted to the apartment of the princess, and it was really a magnificent affair. The second was divided into several rooms. In one you saw a fine library, in another a wardrobe full of beautiful linen and superb dresses for all ages, each more splendid than the other. A third was appropriated to music, 
a fourth was entirely filled with the most agreeable wines and liqueurs, and in the last, which was the largest of all, nothing was to be seen but wet and dry sweetmeats, and preserves of every description, and all sorts of pies and patties, which by the power of the enchantment were kept always as warm as they were when first taken out of the oven. The tower was terminated by a platform, on which there was a garden laid out full of the finest flowers, which were renewed and succeeded each other unceasingly. In this garden was also seen a fruit tree of each sort, on which, as fast as you gathered one fruit, another appeared in its place. This lovely spot was ornamented by green arbours, rendered delicious by the shade and fragrance of the flowering shrubs that formed them, and the songs of the thousand birds that frequented them. When the fairies had placed Galantine in the tower, with a governess named Bonnet, they remounted the whale that had taken them there, and retiring a certain distance from this grand edifice, the fairy grave, by a tap of her wand on the water, assembled two thousand of the most ferocious sharks in the ocean, and ordered them to keep strict watch around the tower, and tear in pieces every mortal who should be rash enough to approach it. But as ships are not much afraid of sharks, she also sent for a quantity of remoras. Footnote, that is, the sea lamprey, a small fish, that by adhering to the keels of ships was supposed to have the power of stopping them, or at least of retarding their progress. End of footnote. And commanded them to form an advanced guard, and stop, without exception, every vessel that by design or accident shaped its course in that direction. Fairy Grave felt so fatigued with having done so much in so short a time, that she requested Fairy Revous to fly to the top of the tower, and enchant the air about it so powerfully and completely that not even a bird should be able to go near it. The fairy obeyed, but as she was an exceedingly absent being, she forgot some of the necessary ceremonies, and made some few mistakes. If the enchantment of the water had not been more perfect than that of the air, the safekeeping of Galantine, which they took so much trouble about, would have been greatly endangered by sea. The good governess occupied every instant of her time in the proper education of Galantine, and although she looked upon all the accomplishments that the princess acquired as completely thrown away on one who would never have an opportunity of displaying them to the world, she neglected nothing that could tend to the improvement of her mind and the cultivation of her talents in all imaginable arts and sciences. When the princess had attained the age of twelve, she appeared to the governess a perfect prodigy. All the fine qualities she discovered in her caused her deeply to deplore the sad fate imposed on so amiable a person. Galantine, who knew nothing about herself, perceiving her one day more melancholy than usual, entreated to know the reason of it so urgently that Bonnet related to her all her own history and that of the queen her mother. Galantine was thunderstruck at this recital. "'I had never before,' she exclaimed, "'reflected on my position.' I fancied that when I was old enough I should leave this retreat, but if I am condemned never to do so, of what value is life to me? Better surely would it be for me to die. The princess, after this burst of grief, remained silent for some time, then added, You say, my dear Bonnet, that the spell which is cast upon me cannot be broken until I shall love someone who loves me? Is this so difficult a matter? I don't know what it may be, but I would endure anything that could assist to release me from this prison. Bonnet could not help smiling at the simplicity of Galantine, and then answered, To love and to be beloved, it is necessary that some young prince should enter this tower to see and be seen by you, and that he should be one who intends to marry you, otherwise his appearance here would not be correct. Now you know that it is not possible for any man to approach these walls. Have I not told you all the precautions that have been taken by sea and by sky? You must therefore, my dear Galantine, make up your mind to pass your days in this solitude. This conversation produced a great change in the princess. No amusements had charms for her any longer. Her melancholy became excessive. She passed her days in weeping and in devising plans to escape from the tower. One day that the princess was sitting in her balcony, she saw an extraordinary figure emerge from the water. She called Bonnet immediately to come and observe it. It had the appearance of a man with a bluish countenance and ill-curled hair of a sea-green colour. 
he approached the tower, and the sharks made no opposition to his progress. "'In my opinion,' said the governess, "'it is a merman.' "'A man, do you say?' exclaimed Galantine. "'Let us go down to the gate of the tower. We shall see him better there.' As soon as they reached the gate, the merman stopped to gaze on the princess, and at her sight made several signs of admiration. He said something to her in his very hoarse voice, but as he found his language was not understood, he had recourse again to signs. He had in his hand a little rush basket filled with the rarest shells. He presented it to the princess, who took it, and in her turn made signs to thank him. But as night was coming on, she retired, and the merman plunged under water. As soon as Galantine had reached her own apartment, she said to her governess sorrowfully, I think that man frightful. Why did the villainous sharks who guard me allow such an ugly man to pass them, in preference to one who was better looking? For I suppose they are not all like him. Not any like him, I should say, replied Bonnette. And as to the sharks allowing him to pass, I presume that, being inhabitants of the same element, they do not harm each other. They may even be his relations, or at least friends. End of part one. End of section 27. Section 28 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Impossible Enchantment by the Count de Calus. Translated by James Planchet. Part 2. A few days after this first adventure, Bonnette and Galantine were attracted to one of the windows of the tower by what appeared to them a singular sort of music, and which indeed proved to be so. There was the same merman that they had already seen, who, always up to his waist in the water and his head covered with reeds, blew with all his might a species of conch shell, the sound of which was something like that of our ancient goat's horns. The princess again descended to the gate of the tower, and courteously accepted the coral and other marine curiosities which he presented to her. After this second visit, he came every day under the windows of the princess, diving and grimacing, or playing on the charming instrument I have described to you. Galantine contented herself with curtsying to him in the balcony, but no longer came downstairs, notwithstanding the signs by which the merman implored her. Some days afterwards, the princess saw him appear in company with another of his species of the other sex. Her hair was dressed with much taste, and her voice was charming. This addition to the company induced Galantine and Bonnette to descend again to the gate of the tower. They were much surprised when the lady, whom they now saw for the first time, after having tried several languages, spoke to them in their own, and complimented Galantine on her beauty. She perceived that the basement story, or bathroom, of which I have spoken, was open and full of water. Here, said she, is a place made expressly for our reception, for it is impossible for us to live entirely out of our element. She immediately entered and reclined as one does in a bath, and her brother, for she was the sister of the merman, placed himself beside her in a similar attitude. The princess and her governess sat down on the steps, which were continued round the apartment. I suspect, madam, said the siren, that you have abandoned your residence on the earth in consequence of being beset by crowds of lovers. If that be really the cause of your retirement, you will not obtain your object here, for my brother is already dying for love of you, and when the inhabitants of our great city have perceived you, he will certainly have them all for his rivals. The brother, who imagined she was speaking of him, at that moment made signs of assent with his head and his hands, and continued to do so when she was not speaking of him at all. The siren expressed to her the regret of her brother at not being able to make himself understood. I am his interpreter, she continued, thanks to the languages which I was taught by a fairy. You have fairies, then, also amongst you? said Galantine, accompanying the question with a heavy sigh. Yes, madam, replied the siren, we have a few, but, if I am not deceived, you have suffered some injuries from those who inhabit the earth. At least, the sigh which escaped you would justify me in so believing. The princess, who had not been enjoined secrecy on the subject, 
recounted to the siren all that Bonnette had told her. "'You are much to be pitied,' said the siren, when Galantine had finished her story. "'Nevertheless, your misfortunes may not be without a remedy. "'But it is time to terminate my first visit.' The princess, delighted at the hope she held out to her, said a thousand kind things to her, and they separated with a promise to see one another frequently. The princess appeared charmed with this adventure. Independently of the hope the siren had inspired her with, it was much to have found someone with whom it was possible to enjoy a little society. "'We shall make the acquaintance,' said she to her governess, "'of several of these mermen, and they may not all be as hideous as the first we have seen.' At any rate, we shall not be always alone. Good heavens, said Bonnet, how easily young people do flatter themselves. I tell you, I am afraid of these folks. But what say you, continued she, to the handsome lover of whom you have made a conquest? I say that I shall never love him, replied the princess, and that he is exceedingly disagreeable to me. But, pursued she, I would fain discover if he cannot, by means of his relative, the fairy Marine, contrive to do me some service i repeat to you insisted bonnette that those odd-coloured faces and great fish-tails are alarming but galantine being younger was consequently bolder and less prudent the siren came to see her several times and always talked to her of her brother's affection the princess constantly occupied by her ideas of escaping from prison encouraged the conversation and at length induced the siren to promise she would bring the fairy marine to pay her an early visit and that she would instruct her what to do the fairy came with the siren the very next morning the princess received her as her liberator some short time after her arrival she requested galantine to show her over the tower and to take a turn with her in the garden for with the assistance of two crutches she could manage to walk about and as she was a fairy she was able to remain out of the water as long as she pleased only it was necessary for her to moisten her forehead occasionally for which purpose she always carried a little silver fountain suspended from her girdle galantine acceded to the request of the fairy and bonnette remained in the hall to entertain the rest of the company when the fairy and the princess had entered the garden the former said let us lose no time let us see if there is anything i can do to serve you Galantine told her all her history, not omitting the smallest details, and the fairy then said to her, I can do nothing for you, my dear princess, on the land. My power does not extend beyond my own element, but you have a resource and one in which I can assist you with all the art I possess. If you will do Gluatan the honour to marry him, an honour which he most ardently aspires to, you can come and live with us. I will teach you in a moment to dive and to swim as well as we do. I will harden your skin without blemishing its whiteness, and so prepare it that the coldness of the water, in lieu of inconveniencing you, shall give you the greatest pleasure. My cousin, added she, is, as you may suppose, one of the best matches in the ocean, and I will do so much for him in consideration of your alliance, that nothing shall have ever equalled your mutual happiness. The fairy spoke with so much fervour, that the princess hesitated to refuse, and requested a few days to consider. As they were about to rejoin the company, they perceived a vessel in the distance. The princess had never before seen one so distinctly, as none had ever ventured to come so near the tower. They could easily distinguish on the deck of this ship a young man reclining under a magnificent pavilion, and who appeared to be very attentively surveying the tower by means of a telescope but the distance was still too great for them to see anything more. The vessel beginning to recede, Galantine and the fairy returned to the company, the latter much pleased at the progress of her negotiation. She told the princess, on leaving her, that she should shortly come again to know her answer. As soon as the fairy was gone, Galantine related to her governess all that had passed between them. She was very sorry to see that her pupil was half inclined to yield to the fairy's persuasions. She was dreadfully afraid of being compelled in her declining years to become an old siren herself. To avert all the misfortunes she foresaw, she hit upon the following idea. As she could paint miniatures to perfection, she set to work, and by the next morning produced one of a young man with fair hair, dressed in large curls, the finest complexion in the world, blue eyes, and his nose slightly retroussé. 
in fact, presenting an assemblage of all the features that could compose a charming portrait, and we shall see in the end that some supernatural power must have assisted her in a work which she had undertaken solely to show Galantine the difference between a man of the world and her marine adorer, and so dissuade her from a marriage which was not at all to her taste. When she presented her work to her, the princess was struck with admiration, and asked her if it were possible that any man on earth could resemble that portrait. Bonnet assured her that there were many such, and some even handsomer. I can scarcely believe it, replied Galantine, but alas, neither the original of this portrait, nor any one like him, can ever be my husband. They will never see me, nor I them as long as I live. Oh, how miserable is my fate! Nevertheless, Galantine passed the whole day in gazing on this miniature. It had the effect Bonnet anticipated. It ruined Gloatin's affairs, which had previously been put in pretty good train. But the governess almost repented having painted so handsome a face, as the princess gave up eating and drinking, in order to have more time to gaze upon it. If ever a portrait was capable of inspiring a real passion, it was assuredly in this case, and under the circumstances here related. The fairy marine returned a few days after the visit we have described, to ascertain what were the intentions of Galantine. But this young creature, engrossed by her new passion, for she was positively in love with the portrait, could not control herself as prudence would have suggested. She not only broke off with the fairy abruptly, but, what was worse, she exhibited so much contempt and aversion for Guata, that the fairy, indignant at the style of her refusal, left the princess with a determination to be revenged. In the meanwhile, the princess had made a conquest she was unconscious of. The vessel she had seen so near her residence had on board the handsomest prince in the world. He had heard of the enchanted tower, and determined to go nearer to it than any one had yet done. He possessed such excellent glasses that in surveying the tower simply from a motive of curiosity, he caught sight of the princess, and the best proof of the goodness of his glass, and that he must have seen her distinctly, is that he fell desperately in love with her. Like a young man and a new lover, two conditions in which nothing is thought too hazardous, he was eager to cast anchor near the tower, lower a boat, and encounter all the dangers that the enchantment could threaten him with. But all his crew upon their knees implored him not to venture. His equerry, who was more frightened than any, or whose knowledge of the circumstances rendered him more competent to form an opinion, was most eloquent. You would lead us all to certain death, my lord, said he. Deign to return on shore, and I promise you to go in search of the fairy commode. She is a relation of mine, and has always been very fond of me. I will answer for her zeal and her skill. I am perfectly sure she will do you good service. The prince yielded, but very reluctantly, to so many good arguments. He landed, therefore, on the nearest point of land, and dispatched his equerry to find his relative, and implore her protection and assistance. In the meanwhile, he ordered a tent to be pitched on the seashore, and, glass in hand, sat incessantly looking either at the princess or at her prison, and his imagination becoming more and more excited, often presented to him its own creations for realities. At the end of a few days, the equerry returned with the fairy commode. The prince received her with the greatest demonstrations of affection. The equerry had informed her, during their journey, of the state of the case, in order to lose no time, said she to the prince, I will send a white pigeon, in which I place implicit confidence, to examine the enchantment. If he finds a flaw in it anywhere, he shall enter the garden that crowns the tower, and I will order him to bring back some flowers, as a proof that he succeeded in finding an entrance. If he can get in, I will soon find a way to introduce you. But, said the prince, can I not, by means of your pigeon, send a note to the princess? declaring the passion with which she has inspired me certainly you can said commode and i advise you to do so the prince immediately wrote the following letter prince blondin to princess galantine i adore you and i am aware of your destiny if beautiful princess you will deign to accept the homage of my heart there is nothing i will not undertake to render myself the happiest of men by terminating your misfortunes blondin when this note was written, they tied it round the neck of the pigeon, who only awaited his dispatches. 
for he had already received his instructions. He rose gracefully into the air, and flew off as fast as his wings would carry him. But when he approached the tower, there issued from it a furious wind that repelled him violently. He was not, however, to be disheartened by such an obstacle, and after making many circles round and round about the building, he discovered the weak point, which the fairy Rivouz had left in the enchantment. He slipped through it instantly, and flew down into the garden, to wait for the princess and to rest himself. The princess generally took her walk alone, from inclination because a passion engrossed her heart, from necessity because the governess could no longer ascend to that height without great fatigue. As soon as the pigeon saw her appear, he flew to her in the most flattering manner. Galantine caressed him, and seeing a rose-coloured ribbon round his neck, she wondered what it was put there for. How great was her surprise when she perceived the note. She read it, and this was the answer she returned by the pigeon. Princess Galantine to Prince Blondin. You say that you have seen me, and that you love me. I cannot love you, nor promise to love you, without having seen you. Send me your portrait by the same courier. If I return it to you, hope nothing. But if I keep it, be assured that in working for me, you work for yourself. Galantine. She fastened this letter in the same manner as they had done that which she had just received, and dismissed the pigeon, who did not forget that he was ordered to bring back a flower from the garden. But as he was well aware of the importance lovers often attach to trifles, he stole one from a bouquet the princess wore in her bosom, and flew away. The return of this bird gave the prince such extreme delight that, but for the anxiety he was still under, he might perhaps have lost his senses. He wanted to send the pigeon back instantly, with a miniature of himself, which, by the greatest chance in the world, he happened to have amongst his baggage. But the fairy insisted on an hour's rest for her courier, which the prince employed in writing verses to send with his portrait. The pigeon, duly furnished with miniature and verses, set out once more for the tower. The princess was not certain he would return so soon, but she was looking out for him notwithstanding. She was in the garden, and had said nothing of this last adventure to her governess, for she began to feel that love of mystery and reserve with which a first passion usually inspires one. She eagerly detached the miniature from the pigeon's neck, and her surprise was infinite when, on opening the case, she discovered that the portrait of Prince Blondin perfectly resembled that which Bonnet had painted from fancy. It was one of those fortunate accidents which it is impossible to account for. The delight of Galantine was extreme at making this agreeable discovery, and to express in the prettiest possible way her own sentiments, she took the prince's miniature out of its case, put in its place the one she thought best of the many which Bonnet had painted of her, and immediately sent the pigeon back with it, who began to be rather fatigued, and would not long have been able to serve two lovers who kept up a correspondence so uncommonly active. Prince Blondin had kept his eyes constantly turned in the direction of the tower, awaiting the return of his courier. At length he saw the blessed pigeon approaching, but what were his feelings as soon as he could discern that the bird had fastened round his neck the same case that he had taken away with him? He was nearly dying with grief. The fairy, who had never left him, consoled him as well as she could, and took herself from the pigeon's neck the case which he even refused to look at. She opened it, and pointed out to him his error. In an instant he went into a transport of joy that could only be compared for its intensity to that which he had just endured of affliction. "'We will lose no time,' said Commode. "'I can only make you happy by changing you into a bird. But I will take care that you shall be re-transformed at the right moment.' The prince, without hesitation, consented to the transformation, and to anything else which could assist him to approach the person he adored. The good commode thereupon touched him with her wand, and he became in an instant the prettiest little hummingbird in the world, joining to the attractions which nature has bestowed on that charming bird, that of being able to speak in the most agreeable way possible. The pigeon received fresh orders to conduct him to the garden. Galantine was astonished to see the bird she had no knowledge of, but his being accompanied by the pigeon put her heart in a flutter, and the hummingbird, flying to her, said, "'Good morning, beautiful princess.' 
She had never before heard a bird speak, and this novelty increased the gratification with which she received this one. She took him on her finger, and he immediately said to her, Kiss, kiss Colibri. She did so with great pleasure, over and over again. I leave you to imagine if the prince was delighted, and if he was not at the same time very much vexed that he was only a hummingbird, for lovers are the only persons in the world who are happy and miserable at the same time. Commode, however, knew by her art that this was exactly the moment to restore the prince to his natural form, which she did so quickly that the princess, in the twinkling of an eye, found herself pressed to the heart of a lover whom she loved. The spell was broken. That instant the tower trembled and dropped to its foundations. Its walls even began to open. Bonnet, who was below stairs in the greatest alarm, ascended to the terrace, at least to perish with the princess. The rocking of the tower increased as she mounted the staircase, and when she arrived at the top she saw the whole building lean over, and on the verge of falling into the sea, she fainted outright. At the same moment the two fairies, Commode and Paceville, arrived in a chariot of Venetian glass, drawn by six eagles of the largest size. "'Save yourselves quickly!' they cried to the two lovers. "'The tower is falling, and you will perish with it!' They leapt into the fairy car, without having had time to say a word to each other. But the prince managed at the same moment to fling the governess, still in her swoon, into the bottom of the car. Scarcely had they begun to rise in the air when the tower toppled over, and with a horrible noise fell a mass of ruins into the sea. The fairy marine, Gautin, and his friends, in order to be revenged on the princess, had sapped the foundations. Marine, perceiving that her designs were foiled by the intervention of the two fairies, determined to try if she could not by open war obtain possession of Galantine. She suddenly formed an immense chariot out of some exhalations, and entering it with all her family, filled every available space in it with oysters in their shells, fragments of rock, stones, and other trifles of that description. With this chariot and this ammunition, she caused herself to be wafted by a high wind to the seashore, to intercept the car of glass. She did even more. She commanded all the wild ducks and sea-fowl of every sort, for ten leagues round, to come in flocks to darken the air, and oppose the landing of the fairies. This order was executed with a quacking and squalling that was insupportable. Our two lovers thought themselves lost, but as they had a taste for the destruction of enchantments, they wished to try what they could do against this. The fairies, however, did not consider it necessary. Commode produced from the box seat of the car a great quantity of petards and rockets, which she had provided apparently for the purpose of making a display of fireworks. But whatever might have been her reason for bringing them, she now used them with much effect, for she directed so many against these troublesome fowl that they were compelled to disperse. The enemy in the chariot then had recourse to their last weapons. Not one of the marine party doubted that, with the oysters and stones, they should shatter the glass car to fragments in a few moments. It was not a bad idea, and we may even presume that they would have achieved their object if the fairy Paisival had not taken out of her pocket a burning glass which she always carried about with her. It is best to be candid. I frankly admit that I never very clearly understood for what purpose she constantly carried that particular utensil. But she placed it, however, on this occasion, in such a position that it speedily warmed her enemies, after a fashion as new as it was disagreeable. They uttered the most fearful shrieks, and the exhalations being dispelled by the power of the sun, all the marine family, with the fairy herself, were precipitated pell-mell into the ocean, leaving our two victorious fairies to continue their journey to the dominions of Queen Moutine. On arriving in them, they found she was dead. She had endeavoured, partly from fear of some new punishment, partly from conviction, to control her temper. In this attempt, she had swallowed so many violent expressions and stifled so many wicked impulses that these prodigious and continued efforts after causing her several severe fits of illness, at length terminated fatally. She had been dead indeed some years. The good king who had married her quietly enjoyed the sweets of his widowhood, and though he had no other children than the daughter whom he never expected to see again, nothing in the world could have induced him to marry a second time. 
He governed his estates very peacefully, and the good King Prudent, Galantine's grandfather, had just arrived, notwithstanding his great age, to pass the holidays with him. What joy for these two worthy sovereigns! The whole court soon participated in it, as the news spread of the arrival of the fairies with a charming princess, who was their king's daughter. The marriage of the two lovers was fixed for the next morning. Couriers were instantly dispatched in all directions, to beg the fairies generally to honour the nuptials with their presence. You may believe that fairy grave was not forgotten. In short, they arrived from all quarters. Festivities, balls, tournaments, grand banquets succeeded each other for many days. They bantered, and at the same time thanked, fairy Revuse for the blunder she had made in her enchantments. She defended herself by observing that lovers were always more ingenious than magicians were skilful, and that to prevent their success it would require an enchantment that was impossible. I forgot to tell you that the governess recovered from her swoon immediately on her arriving at the palace. In short, everybody was satisfied, and the fairies, after sharing in the festivities for several days, departed, each to manage her own affairs or to enjoy new pleasures. Our lovers were always constant, and became the happiest sovereigns on the face of the earth. End of part two. End of the impossible enchantment. End of section twenty-eight. Section twenty-nine of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeanette Edwards Bluet and Coquelicot by Comte de Luce, Translated by James Planchet There was once upon a time a fairy named Bonbon, who became weary of the great offices in fairyland to which her character and talents had elevated her. She retired from state affairs, and chose for her retreat an island situated in the midst of a very beautiful lake, bordered by the most rich, smiling, and luxuriant scenery. This charming retreat was called the Island of Happiness. It is known to have existed. It is even believed by some to be always in the country adjoining their own. But the geographers have not yet laid it down in any map, and I have never read of any traveler fortunate enough to land on it. It is sufficient for us, however, that we have a full account of it in the annals of the fairies. Bonbon, as we have already stated, weary of the world and not caring to pay court to it, demanded of the Queen of the Fairies permission to withdraw from it altogether, and went to reside in the Island of Happiness. It was there that, with the finest library and all the knowledge she had acquired in the world, she became the most clever of all the fairies. She made all her neighbors happy, and gratitude was the foundation of her authority. Independently of a natural inclination to oblige, a sentiment which retirement from the great world by no means tends to diminish, there is a great satisfaction in seeing those around us happy. In order to enjoy this real pleasure, and at the same time to avoid being overwhelmed with foolish petitions, she had placed at short distances from each other columns of white marble, to which those addressed themselves who had either requests or complaints to make. These columns were constructed in such a manner that, on speaking in a whisper to them, they repeated every word distinctly and in the same tone of voice in a cabinet of the castle. Bonbon had lodged in this cabinet a niece, whom she had brought up as a fairy, and who gave her an account every evening of all that the columns had reported and the fairy then pronounced her decisions. The principal occupation of Bonbon was to educate and make children happy. She gave them for breakfast as well as for luncheon everything they could wish for in sweetmeats and pastry. But when they had been a fortnight in this happy dwelling, they cared no more for sugar plums, but passed the day in running on the grass, gathering nuts in the woods, or flowers in the gardens. They went on the lake in pretty boats, which they rowed themselves. In short, they did all day just whatever they liked, and happiness consists principally in liberty. It is true that they had nurses and tutors, but they were generally invisible. 
They informed Bonbon of anything their pupils had done that was wrong, and for this she reprimanded the offender, but always with mildness, for she was the most kind-hearted woman in the world. Sometimes the nurses and preceptors made themselves visible, and on these occasions they might be seen supping altogether on the turf, or dancing and singing, or amusing themselves in making toys and dolls. In short, nothing had an air of severity in this happy abode, and no one left it without the greatest regret. But as all must submit to fate, and the fairies themselves are obliged to obey it, when the young people had attained a certain age, that is to say twelve or fifteen years, and when the lessons of the fairy had made a sort of impression on the minds of her pupils, and she considered them sufficiently well informed to enter into the world, she was obliged to send them home, which she always did laden with caresses and presents, and assurances of a friendship, the proof of which she frequently gave them in the after-course of their lives. Amongst the number of children confided to her care by her parents, there was a little girl named Bluette, so pretty and so good, that Bonbon bon preferred her to all the rest, and loved her to distraction. She was affectionate without being troublesome, and lively without being fatiguing. Her face expressed the sweetness of her character. Her beauty increased with her age, and possessed that peculiar brilliancy which is so dazzling. It is to her rare beauty that we owe the familiar saying, still in use amongst us, when we speak of anything which has dazzled us. Je vous des Bluette. A boy about two years older than Bluette also inhabited the island of happiness. He was called Coquelicot. His face was charming. It was as bright as his mind, and his pretty little graceful ways were equally pleasing to Bonbon. That which rendered both more charming was that in their infancy they became inseparable, and that the vivacity of the one was tempered by the mildness and tenderness of the other. Bonbon daily enjoyed observing the impression and progress which true love makes upon innocence and ingenuousness. She was constantly occupied in the study of it, and felt that all other happiness, which she knew so well how to procure, could not be compared to it. Indeed, what felicity can be placed in the balance with that of two hearts which love has united by similarity of taste and temper? Coquelicot, quick as he was, perhaps indeed too soon excited, was moderate and even mild in all that regarded Bluette, who on her part was only animated and vivacious in matters which concerned Coquelicot. The birth and progress of these sentiments had been their delight. The sweet emotions which they exhibited were the charm of Bonbon's existence, for she said to herself a hundred times, "'Good heavens! How pretty are these poor children! How they love each other! How happy they are! They never think of leaving my island! Never have more happy subjects inhabited my empire!' On an evening of one of the most beautiful of summer days, all the lovely children were playing and amusing themselves in different parts of this enchanted residence, when all at once there appeared in the air a car drawn by six flame-colored griffins. The car was of the same color, relieved with black ornaments. It bore the fairy Arganto. Her hair was powdered brown with a slight sprinkle of red. Her dress was the same color as the car. Her griffins alighted at the portico of the castle, whither Bonbon and her niece had repaired to do the honors to the fairy, and assist her to descend. After the first compliments, Arganto confessed to Bonbon that, not being able to understand the pleasures of retirement, and disgusted by some disagreements at court, she had wished to judge for herself of the pleasures and cares of a life like hers, and that, in order to be perfectly enlightened on the subject, she had come to the resolution of passing some days with her. Bonbon kindly replied that she would willingly satisfy her and hide nothing from her. The beauties of nature, added she, are the pictures which I study. Its fruits are my treasures, its secrets the object of my researches, and my pleasures are solely dependent on the happiness of others. 
Infancy is the state of humanity which can be made the most happy. You will find me, therefore, only surrounded by the prettiest children nature has produced. So saying, she led Arganto further into the island, at each step encountering troops of little children of both sexes and all ages, whose natural manners inspired true gaiety. Some danced, others played at blind man's bluff, some amused themselves playing at ladies and gentlemen. In short, they passed quickly from one fancy to another. Their characters were thus developed, and it was easy to imagine what each would become at a more advanced age. Argato thought this recreation of Bonbon very poor. She judged of it as a person of fashion, that is to say, with contempt. She told her companion that she could not conceive the pleasure of such amusements, unless some ingenuity was employed to improve them. It was in vain that Bonbon eulogized them. She would not be persuaded. At length, continuing their walk, they met Bluette and Coquelicot conversing together, who saw nothing but themselves in nature, and who had no pleasure, no wish, no occupation, nor will but in common. Bonbon called them, and they ran towards her with that confidence and affection which her goodness and their gratitude had inspired them with. Arganto was struck with the charms of their countenances, and said as much to them. They blushed and thanked the fairy for each other. "'I agree,' she said to Bonbon, "'that nature could not present a more agreeable picture than that of these lovely children, but,' continued she, "'are they as intelligent as their features would seem to denote?' "'Most assuredly.' replied Bonbon. It may not be, perhaps, the kind of intelligence to please you, for it is quite natural. Besides this, they love each other more than they choose to acknowledge, especially to a stranger. The fairies then embraced them a thousand times, and left them together. Bonbon agreed with Arganto not to trouble herself about her during her stay, but to occupy herself as usual with her studies. But the latter could not help speaking of the impression which Bluette and Coquelicot had made on her, and she requested they might keep her company. Arganto was born wicked, and wickedness looks with impatience on the happiness of others, and is always at work to destroy it, even if with no other motive than that of doing mischief. Upon these fearful principles, she employed the time of her visit in pointing out to her young companions the poverty and sipidity of the place they inhabited. They whom nature had formed for the delight and ornament of the most brilliant court. And then she gave them a glowing description of the abodes of kings. "'You are enchanted,' said she continually, "'with the life which you lead. But do you know any other?' the splendor of the world, the fetes which are given to beauty alone, the preference which is at all times accorded to it, are the real triumphs of a pretty girl. It was thus she spoke to Bluette. And you, addressing herself to Coquelicot, with the spirit you possess, what would you not do at court? You certainly must be brave." And of what are you not capable? This wicked discourse made by degrees the impression which Arganto wished upon the minds of these amiable children. They sought each other's company as usual, but they found each other no longer occupied with themselves alone. They began by self-reproaches, and at length made reciprocal confessions, for they could no longer talk of anything else but the opinions of the fairy. Love and the hope of not being separated, it is true, were the foundation of their projects. But curiosity and the novelty of all which Arganto had told them, and above all self-love, the poison of life, perverted at length their innocent minds. They abandoned themselves to the wicked fairy, who, in order to make them fall more easily into the snare she had laid for them, did not neglect to destroy the respect and gratitude they entertained for Bonbon by telling them, She is a provincial fairy whose taste is not at all refined, her character not suiting the court. She is too happy to be able to keep you with her. 
she sacrifices your fortunes to the pleasure and use which you are of to her. It was by such discourse as this that she induced these children to become ungrateful. She promised them not to forsake them, and she assured them that, being a more powerful fairy than Bonbon, they need not be anxious about anything. She did even more. She warned them of all that the good fairy would say to them when she should learn the resolution they had taken. In short, they promised to follow her after she had given them her word that they should not be separated. When Arganto was well assured of the part they had taken, she said to Bonbon that it was time she should cease to trouble her in her retreat, and begged her at the same time to allow her to take with her Bluette and Coquelicot. The good fairy, who had perceived nothing, and who had no suspicion of the designs of Arganto, as she had herself ordered them to pay court to and obey the fairy while she was occupied in her cabinet, and above all, because a good heart cannot imagine ingratitude. Bonbon, as I said before, consented to Arganto's request, with the understanding, however, that the proposition should please the young couple, feeling quite convinced that they would never wish to leave her. The question was put to them on the spot. What was the astonishment of Bonbon when they accepted the proposal to abandon her and follow the fairy? They said it not all her reasonings, so full of friendship and good advice. They were too deeply prejudiced against her. Bonbon then said to them with mildness, It is conviction which makes happiness. You would cease to be happy in this abode, because you imagine greater felicity awaits you in another country. Depart, let nothing detain you, said she with tears in her eyes. May you be contented. Bluette and Coquelicot were moved by this tender discourse, and on the point of falling at the feet of this adorable fairy, and conjuring her to forget that they had ever had the idea of separating from her. But the emotion they felt at the moment made them both faint away so that the wickedness of Arganto was not required to counteract this return of good feeling. She herself was touched by so tender a scene, and at the moment almost repented having caused so much sorrow to three persons, who were only to blame for placing too much confidence in her. Not knowing exactly what to do, she prepared to set out alone when Bonbon said, I might complain of the manner in which you have abused the reception I have given you. But the great fruit of study and of solitude is forgiveness of injuries. I am not, therefore, at all affected by it myself. But I feel for the misfortune of these young people. I love them both. I will not take them away, then, replied Arganto. You see, they have refused me, and you cannot doubt the attachment they feel for you. No, replied Bonbon. I feel myself compelled to beg you to take with you those I loved best in my retreat. You have perverted them. Their hearts are no longer what they were. They would henceforth only live with me out of compliment. If they had sufficient art to disguise it from me, could I be ignorant of their thoughts? Take them, then, I conjure you and at least protect them amongst the dangers to which you expose them. As you absolutely wish it, replied Arganto, I will do so. She then carried them, fainting as they were, both into her car, and her griffins flying at a rapid pace speedily landed them in the kingdom of heirs. The king who governed it at that time thought himself the greatest of princes, Flattery had persuaded him that he was descended from the gods. In consequence of this idea, he caused himself to be worshipped by his subjects. His throne of gold and precious stones, upon which he only appeared once a month, was surrounded by tigers and elephants, bound with chains of the same precious materials, and covered with superb embroidery. Without entering into further details of the ceremonies of this court, Suffice it to say, the king exhibited upon every occasion all the ostentation with which a crown could inspire him. Arganto was his best friend, 
the partaker of his pleasures, and it was into the superb palace which she possessed at his court that she conducted Bluette and Coquelicot. The moment they recovered from their swoon, they had the pleasure of seeing each other. The magnificence of the place in which they found themselves astonished them. Their uncertainty did not last long. Arganto entered to dissipate it. They immediately asked her to give them some news of Bonbon. The fairy informed them that Bonbon had consented to their advancement, and had herself conjured her to take them away. Bluette and Coquelicot were comforted by this account, for they had been afraid of displeasing her. Arganto then said to them, "'Here, Bluette, is the apartment prepared for you. Your household shall be formed to-night. Meanwhile, here are your waiting women. Let me present them to you.' At these words there appeared a dozen handsome young persons, carrying all the innumerable trifles which have become so necessary to a lady's toilet. They were followed by an equal number of valets de chambre, bearing boxes and caskets, and who in a few moments fitted up and set out a most superb dressing-table. Garments adapted to the season then appeared in such great profusion that they covered all the chairs, beds, and couches in this large apartment. When everything was arranged according to the fairy's pleasure, she said to Bluette, "'This all belongs to you, and you have nothing to study but how to avail yourself of it.' She then showed her a basket full of ornaments, and a jewel-case crammed with precious stones as perfect in themselves as they were tastefully set, saying to her, "'Beautiful Bluette, this little jewel-box will amuse you.' But let us now proceed to the apartment I destine for Coquelicot. Bluette followed the fairy without being able to reply. Her surprise and astonishment appeared to her like a beautiful dream. They all three passed into another apartment. It was plain but neat. Four valets de chambre, who were in the second room, stepped forward and presented him with clothes as tasteful as they were superb in order that he might select those in which he wished to appear that day. They then opened the door of a sort of large cabinet, containing all kinds of musical instruments, also a library well stocked with historical works, but more particularly with romance and fairy tales. Behold, said Arganto, what will amuse you when you are weary of the pleasures of society, or require rest after exercise? She then commanded the person she had chosen for his equerry to appear. You may, said she to Coquelicot, take his advice. He is a man to be depended on, and a good companion. Show, continued she to this gentleman, the things of which you have the charge. There then appeared servants in livery, who carried the most magnificent and perfect arms of war in the chase. And even this was not all. "'Let us,' said Arganto, "'look out the window.' They obeyed her, and perceived fifty saddled horses, led by five-and-twenty grooms, superbly clothed and well-mounted. "'There,' said she, "'are your horses for hunting and riding.' She then ordered out the carriages. Berlin's, Berlingots, vis-à-vis, calèche of all kind, defiled under the windows, drawn by the prettiest and best-groomed horses in the world, with their manes tastefully plaited. Coquelicot, as much astonished as Bluette, observed also the same silence. "'Learn, both of you,' said Arganto, "'to make good use of what I have just given you.' You are both charming, but believe me, dress is necessary to beauty. She then left them in their separate apartments, questioning their new domestics on the particular use of all the novelties that surrounded them, for they dared not yet give any orders. They at length dressed themselves, and Coquelicot proceeding to the apartment of Bluette, they were mutually astonished at the agreeable effect of their attire and uttering a hundred praises of the good taste of Arganto, they became more than ever convinced of the truth of what she had told them respecting Bonbon, 
for whose simplicity they began to blush. All the court, learning of the arrival of Bluet and Coquelicot, either from curiosity or the desire to please the fairy, came with great eagerness to pay her a visit. The king himself did her this honor. The praises of the men of Bluet and those of the women of Coquelicot gratified both exceedingly. They found that the language spoken in this country had an agreeable style hitherto quite unknown to them. They were struck by it, and thought of nothing but imitating it. Bluet, from the first day, perceived that Coquelicot was not made for his fine clothes, and that he had a borrowed air which the other men who surrounded her had not. In short, both were occupied by a thousand new fancies. They saw each other every day, it is true, but they sought each other less, and the tender conversations in which simplicity, ingenuousness, candor, and truth had formerly so large a share, no longer took place between them. They were only anxious now to place their words and turn their phrases according to the style which they had been so much struck with in their new residence. The dress, the magnificence, and the brilliancy with which they dazzled the whole court caused every one to give them the titles of prince and princess. They knew well that they did not deserve them from their low birth, but the mistake of others gratified their vanity. They agreed between them to keep their real condition secret, and hoped privately that their beauty and merit would in time really raise them to that dignity. Coquelicot had perfectly handsome features and a charming figure. He performed all kinds of feats with marvelous success. Almost all the ladies were pulling caps for him. Bluet was not in the least jealous of his conquests, and although in such situations one is not always just, she had at least the generosity not to reproach him in any way. In fact, she deserved reproaching equally herself for the court and its grand airs had changed her heart and mind as much as his. Bluet, on her part, thinking of nothing but how to attract admiration and to outvie all the other beauties of the court, became a practiced coquette. You may easily judge, knowing what I have told you, how long she was in availing herself of all the presence of the fairy. She very soon invented fashions, which all the other ladies, handsome or ugly, were in spite of themselves obliged to follow. During some time this gratification of her vanity only presented to her view jealous rivals. Men captivated and admiring, flattered or plunged into despair by her glances and her deceptive and provoking speeches. But Bluet was so beautiful, she had so much wit and grace that even when making them most miserable, she was the theme of their praises and the object of attraction to all the finest people of the court. She also conducted herself with so much prudence that no one could cast the least slur on her. Coquelico, on his part, fickle adorer of a thousand different objects, flattered his vanity without ever satisfying his heart. Such was the true and unhappy situation in which these two persons— formerly the most loving and amiable possible, found themselves, when this same vanity, the shoal on which so much happiness has been wrecked, was itself violently offended. It must be remembered that, dazzled by the splendor which surrounded them, they had both received with pleasure the titles of princes. But nothing is unknown to the world and such vanity would awaken a contempt for falsehood in those who have no higher motive for despising it. A youth, brought up as they had been by Bonbon in the Island of Happiness, having wandered from it, as many others had done, in passing through several countries, had been attracted to the court inhabited by Bluet and Coquelicot. He was astonished to hear the grand titles of prince and princess added to their well-known names. He ran, however, to the fairy's palace to embrace them. But far from receiving him kindly, they did not condescend even to recognize him. He complained to everybody who would listen to him, and all the court were very soon informed that Princess Bluet and Prince Coquelicot were the children of, t'was true, very honest people, 
but who are nothing but poor shepherds. The court is a region in which nothing is forgiven, and where anything ridiculous is sought for with the greatest eagerness. Therefore it profited by this affair. Songs and epigrams were circulated in a moment, and the objects of their attack could not pretend ignorance of them. For according to the praiseworthy custom of the authors of such works, the first copies were addressed to the persons most interested. Coquelicot was bantered by one of the wits of the court, but he demanded very prompt satisfaction, and the combat in which he killed his adversary brought him honor in a place where truth is so rare. Notwithstanding that a falsehood is never pardoned, they rendered justice to his valor, but they no longer paid him the same attentions. For in short, although riches can obtain everything, the ridicule attached to low birth, combined with vanity, is rarely overlooked at court. As for Bluette, whom wounded pride rendered still more haughty than ever, and who hoped by her beauty and accomplishments to stifle the disagreeable reports which had been spread about her former pastoral condition, Bluette, I must tell you, had in addition the mortification to see some letters which she had had the imprudence to write handed round amongst her acquaintances. Her attraction diminished, and her reputation tarnished, however unjustly, hurt her deeply, and induced her to reflect seriously. Recalling then the remembrance of her former happiness, the words of Bonbon presented themselves to her mind. Bluette, being thus agitated by all the recollections which led her back to her first sentiments for Coquelicot, looked only with regret upon the conduct she had pursued towards him since she had been at court. She was ashamed of it, but it was not possible for her to speak to him openly on the subject. "'You will consider,' said she, my most sincere repentance to be caused either by coquetry or jealousy. And I cannot complain, or he will believe that my birth, being known and made public in this country, has deranged my projects of advancement, and that I am brought back to him only by a feeling of shame and necessity. No, continued she, I will not betray to him all the weakness of my heart, or all the pain which the false friendship of Arganto has caused me. Similar ideas tormented Coquelicot. He thought all those who treated him as formerly like a prince did so in mockery and to ridicule him, and felt satisfied that those whose conduct was changed by the reports which had been spread respecting him would give him continual annoyance. This situation, distressing as it really could well be, was not the sole evil which oppressed him. The remembrance of Bluette, tender, faithful, simple, and innocent, the recollection of the residence of Bonbon, and that of the charm and peace that pervaded it, awoke in his soul so great a disgust for all that the world calls pleasure, and which he had himself taken for happiness, that he determined to fly from the court. They had but to speak to one another, and they would have been convinced and consoled. But still young and inexperienced, they determined on the thing of all others to be avoided in love and friendship. Silence. For want of confidence increases and envenoms the wound we have received, as well as that which we have inflicted on others. Thus, therefore, not daring to look at each other, so much had the shame of their proceedings made an impression on their hearts. They each separately, and without communicating their intentions to any one, made up their minds to quit the court. Solitude appeared to offer them the only chance of consolation. They departed the same morning, just as if they had been acting in concert. They chose the plainest dresses they could find not without regretting those they had brought with them to the court. They would have felt still nearer approaching their former innocence, in habits so vividly recalling the scenes of their past felicity. They took nothing away with them but the portraits which Arganto had had painted of them in miniature, representing them 
as they were when they left the island of happiness. They set out by very different roads, but in proportion as they left the court behind them, nature spoke to their hearts. The song of the birds, the serenity of the air, the view of the country, that sweet freedom which it inspires, all recalled their former happiness, all softened them, and drew them towards each other. But how shall we ever find each other again? said they unceasingly to themselves. I should have convinced him, thought Bluette. She would have pardoned me, sighed Coquelicot. I will return to the court. But how can I reappear there? For each thought the other had remained in the palace. In this miserable condition. The remembrance of Bonbon again presented itself to their mind. It is friendship we invoke in adversity. They resolved then to have recourse to her kindness. If they had not themselves known the delights of the island of happiness, if they had not been anxious to revisit the scenes of their former felicity, it is so natural to desire a similar habitation that we often set out in search of it on the description of others. Each, therefore, turned their steps in the direction of the island. It was very easy for them to find the way, they who had once so worthily inhabited it. They intended to address themselves to one of the columns of which I have spoken, and which conveyed to the ears of the fairy all the requests of her petitioners. What was their surprise, or rather, what was their delight to meet each other again on a spot and in a dress which explained everything? After the first transports, in which the eye hardly sufficed to satisfy the soul, the first words they uttered were, Pardon me, I cannot live without you. The pardon which is mutually sought is soon granted, and it was no longer necessary to employ the aid of the fairy. The unison of their desires had already transported them into the most beautiful spot in the island. They were anxious to excuse themselves and request the forgiveness of Bonbon, but she prevented them. I know all that has happened to you, said she. I have shared your troubles, although they were deserved. Enjoy the happiness of my empire. You are now better able to appreciate its delights. They lived happily because they never ceased to love each other and they died at the same moment. Bonbon bestowed their names upon two wild flowers in order to immortalize their memory. End of section 29